Good evening. I'm Pittsburgh City Councilman Daniel Lavelle. And I'm Councilman Reverend Ricky Burgess. And we welcome you again to Black Pittsburgh Matters. Black Pittsburgh Matters is a series of virtual town hall meetings affirming a citywide agenda that Black Pittsburgh does indeed matter. Black Pittsburgh Matters means that Black lives matter. We must protect the health and safety of Black people. It means that Black communities matter. We must focus on rebuilding and investing in Black communities. And it means that Black wealth matters. We must focus on increasing Black employment and entrepreneurship. The Black community has been disproportionately affected by concurrent crises, the COVID-19 pandemic and its economic crisis, and all the social arrests around racial relations and racial reconciliation, both which are public health crises. Normally, in times of crisis and great change, we'd be coming to you as the Black elected officials of Pittsburgh, having meetings across the city with our constituents, partners, and allies. Since we cannot do so safely in the current pandemic, we're now using this media and platform to come to you ways in which we can to talk about what we're doing and discuss policy and legislation concerning Black Pittsburgh. These means will be available via Facebook, YouTube, and the city's cable channel. You can contact or ask questions via the Black Pittsburgh Matters Facebook page or email us at blackpghmatters at gmail.com. And of course, um, you can um, send us questions through our ad, live ad right now. Today's town hall meeting um, is about Black business and Black entrepreneurship. So one of the key tenants, as we've mentioned on numerous occasions of Black Pittsburgh Matters platform is that Black wealth matters. And to realize Black wealth, we must have to work on building and designing and programming explicitly uh, or programs to bring capital and resources to support Black businesses and entrepreneurship. Toward supporting these goals, the city has implemented several programs and projects, a lot of which I'm hope we're going to be able to discuss tonight, but some of which include Catapult, Invest PG8, and the Avenues of Hope business programs to, re to focus in and rebuild Black business districts. Together with the mayor, we have um, made supporting entrepreneurship uh, pro um, programming a priority of the equity spending task force. Um, the money that the city will receive um, to recover from COVID uh, will be of support. We believe both uh, black business entrepreneurship and um, um, job training, and of course, affordable housing. And um, it gives it a, this special infusion of cash that maybe we've not seen maybe ever in the city, in the city's history. Um, I think people um, don't understand that how significant it is to have a mayor that's willing to spend um, these funds um, equitably, which means disproportionately in black communities. Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting um, because I think probably you as I got to city council um, with the goal of immediately changing our communities. And unfortunately it just doesn't work that way. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, but towards the whole idea of wealth, um, that is literally why I ran for office. And one of our speakers this evening will be able to attest to that because I had to knock on her door when I was initially running and say, hey, look, I'm running because I'm watching or I have watched a brand new arena get built in our neighborhood. And I don't know where the black jobs are. I don't know what benefit that's done to our neighborhood. We still live in that average community of less than $20,000 annual income and something's got to change. And we have to figure out a way to utilize all governmental resources to invest in black communities and rebuild them. Um, and not just for the sake of the black community, it's really for the good of the city. Um, but at the same time, fast forward 10 years and we're now at this point to your point Rav, where we have this moment where we are going to have the largest inflection of money that this city has ever seen. Obviously, the, the majority of it will go towards filling our deficit, which we have to do, that's according to law. But we also have this sort of interesting moment to leverage all the policies, all the programs that we've been working to put in place and really fund them in a meaningful way to rebuild these communities, to invest in the people, to invest in the businesses, and hopefully, finally, really put 
our communities on the financial trajectory that they need to be in order for them to survive and for the city as a whole to survive. And normally you and I would be fighting this fight on council side, you know, fighting other members, trying to get our um, disproportionate share. In this case, we have a mayor who actually is going to join with us on the front end, allow us to work with him to give the council a joint plan um, with us and the mayor saying these are how the dollars need to be spent to make us, you know, a city for all. And I don't, I don't know if people have, understand how unique a moment this is in the history of our city. And I'm, I'm excited. I mean, this is, this is a, a once in a lifetime um, opportunity. And so um, tonight we are honored to be joined by um, two uh, of our city's uh, um, finest minds and experts in economic development. Um, tonight we welcome Ms. Diamante Walker, Deputy Executive Director of the URA, and Ms. Lindsey Powell, Assistant Chief of Staff to Mayor Peduto. Welcome to this evening's town hall meeting. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much. So thank you both for joining us. Um, what I would like to do is just sort of offer up a softball question to begin and then we can really get into the details. If Moby, if maybe, excuse me, both of you would take just a brief minute to talk about your respective offices, the roles that they carry, um, and how your organizations are working to promote the economic development in Pittsburgh and specifically within the Black communities within Pittsburgh. Well, thank you, uh, Councilman Lavelle. I, it seemed like yesterday when you knocked on my door and you were uh, sort of, you were campaigning and you were talking about, and I think I asked you, why are you running? Why do you want to hold this seat? And you said, for you, it was about ensuring that we uh, develop and cultivate a wealthy Black Pittsburgh, that no Black person in Pittsburgh lives below the poverty line and that they have a, a holistic quality of life. Um, I found that very compelling. I think it's maybe 12 or 13 years ago, and I find it even more compelling now um, that we are, you know, sort of in the respective seats that we're in and working together to advance that agenda. And so, you know, both you and uh, Chief Powell are board members at the URA and help to shape and craft a mission that I think uh, exists solely in service to the city of Pittsburgh and advancing um, those goals. And so if I had to give you a mission statement right now for the URA, it's evolving as we continue to do some soul searching, but we really believe that we exist su to support the city of Pittsburgh's economic development goals which right now are centered on uh, designing and creating a city of inclusive opportunity for residents, stakeholders, and communities. And so as the deputy executive director of the URA, you know, I am tasked with doing five critical things. And the first one being uh, creating housing that is more affordable to the average Pittsburgher, not only by way of rental, but also by way of ownership encouraging entrepreneurship and small business development, particularly in black and brown communities where we've struggled uh, to create an inclusive strategy, um, you know, really focusing on not having growth at any expense, meaning we want a smart and inclusive growth plan that will create quality jobs uh, in neighborhoods that have been starved for those kinds of opportunities. And then I think, you know, now that with the advent of COVID, really refocusing on neighborhood and Main Street revitalization efforts. So looking at uh, North Homewood Avenue, looking at Center Avenue, looking at Chartiers Avenue, Perrysville, where these places really intersect that Black life and have been neglected for 60, 70 years. And last but certainly not least, developing a talented workforce that is equipped with the skills for the future. And that is not only outside of the doors of the URA, but also investing in our staff so that we are well positioned to drive and advance this work. So I'm very excited to be here this evening. I think this is my second time on what I believe will be an award-winning show that you've uh, produced here. And so I, you know, very much looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Chief Powell. Um, Director Walker said it so beautifully. Um, I think the city and the URA work hand in hand to ensure that um, our neighborhoods and our residents are able to seek more opportunities, um, you know, through our programs, practices, and policies than they were, you know, kind of before, um, you know, we we started. Uh, 
I like to think the URA, um, you know, really looks at people in terms of their investments uh, when it comes to affordable housing, expanding opportunities for business home uh, business uh, ownership, entrepreneurship, home ownership. Uh, the city's role, you know, is people as well, but but I think also we have a wonderful um, ability to intervene in the spaces. Uh, Pittsburgh for so long, and in particular Black neighborhoods, um, as we all know, has been incredibly divested from, and, and it's not just people, but it's, it's talking about our parks, it's talking about, you know, our green spaces, it's talking about our rec centers, and so the city has done um, a tremendous job of trying to pour back into these places um, in our neighborhoods to ensure that when you're looking around, you see something beautiful. Um, all neighbors deserve beautiful um, spaces, and so thinking about Paulson Rec or Warrington Rec, Jefferson Rec, um, I'm very much a Parks and Recs girl um, in my heart, and and I, I think you can see those investments, you know, easily being, um, you know, some of the most important because they impact some of our youngest Pittsburghers. Uh, for our rec centers, where um, you know you're able to go to a high quality space, get world class, um, you know, tech training along with the hot meal and play basketball, like that's what we want. Um, and so the city, aside from you know capital investments across our neighborhoods, has been really trying to pour into the main streets as well, along with um, some of the efforts that uh, Director Walker was talking about through Avenues of Hope. So it's not just the beautiful green space or play space or third space, but it's also that your you know local uh, business corridors revitalize that you see you know uh, businesses popping up where there weren't, and particularly you see them in black neighborhoods. Uh, not just patient by Black people, but owned by Black people as well. Hey, Ronnie, I, I want to sort of go a little off topic because I, I'm, I'm really, you and I talk a lot about affordable housing and, and you mentioned that first on. I want to just talk a little bit with you about that, if you don't mind. I, I really think um, one of the things that I feel very passionate about, and you and I have done a lot of work to rebuild um, the you know the housing authority to re rebuild its neighborhoods. We've helped do affordable housing in Homewood and and you know Lamar, a lot of places. But one of the things I'm really, really, I feel very strongly about is that we should not just build housing to put people in, but we should build housing where it can be homes, where people can be proud of their neighborhood. Where we transform. One of the things I think about, and there's a long way to get to the question. I think about the children. Where are they growing up at? And will this place that we create for them to grow up in would transform their lives? And, and, and if not, then we shouldn't do it. So I guess, I, tell, talk about, we have as a city and talk a lot about um, mixed income housing, of replacing concentrated poverty with mixed income housing. Of ha how important is it is, that, this is the, really the question. Is it really important for people to have different housing choices, whether it's rental, home ownership, and the former, or is it better just to build housing concentrated for very poor people, at least they'll have some place to live? That's the kind of the two arguments. What do you think? So I think it's a great question, and I, and I don't think I want to answer that question <clears throat> from an or perspective. I think I want to answer that question from an and perspective. And so I think I said this, this this morning on another panel, I think that Pittsburgh is masking its affordable housing crisis by not paying attention to the fact that we have a wage disparity crisis. I think I said at the beginning that I wanna create a more housing that's affordable to the average Pittsburgher. What I really want to do is to create a city where the average Pittsburgher can afford more. And so, you know, and I think those are two very, very different things in that, you know, part of our challenge, and, I, and I'm just gonna be candid here, I think that one of the things that's happened is we've made poor synonymous with black. And that should not be the case. We have a moral and ethical and economic imperative to improve the economic conditions of Black people. And that is not just bending the arc of housing to what people can already afford, but starting to do the real critical work that starts to bring generations along so that the next generation is better positioned. Now, that's not going to happen overnight. And that's why I'm saying it's an and strategy, not an or, because not everybody's going to be a homeowner. Not everybody's going to be an affordable homeowner. We have have to rethink our housing strategy more holistically. We have agencies that are dedicated to low-income housing. 
what are, what is the quality and the focus and the work of that agency? You have agencies like the URA that can help to create more workforce housing uh, to, to help to you know transition you know black homeowners that are at the cap of paying rent into be I mean renters into paying into home ownership. But we've got to work together. It's a little bit. I'm being honest tonight. It's a little bit discoordinated. It's a little. It lacks focus, and there is no sort of umbrella strategy. I think we're all working to do the very best we can from our respective positions. And in this next wave, with these ARP dollars coming down, we're going to have a way to think about this more holistically and more responsibly. And we're going to have the data to support that. So I think that you know we need not pit the haves and the have, you know, the low income from the middle income from the high incomes. How do we create a city where the bottom looks like the middle right now and everybody has access to high quality housing based on what their, what their income is? And then how do we not leave people where we found them with respect to their housing condition? And let me just finish this thought and, and I'll pass it on to Daniel. What, um, one of the things I think people misunderstand is how long it takes to do development. They think that there's all this money in heaven somewhere and we can just make it rain and build 25,000 units of housing in six months. And really it's taken to build 400 units in Larmer, um, it's taken five years. So uh, Lindsay, talk a little bit about that in terms of how your sense of how long it takes to really, even though we're working at it, people don't see um, they don't see their, you know, they don't see the whole communities being transformed by the spring. Absolutely. I mean, there are so many factors that can accelerate or um, slow down a project um, from the very beginning. I think it's, it's even important to start. It's more important to even start before, um, you know, shovels break into the ground, but it's the community planning and design. Um, you know, through you know, the work that your both of your offices have done in the mayor's office, it's been critically important to start there. What does the community want to see? What does affordable housing look like? And not just, you know, how many units, but like stylistically, what do we, how do we want to make sure that these new units, if it's new construction, you know, fits into, um, you know, the existing housing stock? How do we make sure that this isn't, you know, a kind of ugly sore thumb that sticks out? That's that kind of like, you know, marked indicator of affordable housing, right? So it starts at the very community, uh, the community engagement process, which can be incredibly lengthy. Um, no community is a monolith. Um, it takes a lot of time to get to consensus. Um, and so that process alone, as both of you I'm sure can attest to, you know, isn't just a, you know, let's do a few community meetings and get it together. It's, it can be years long. And so even starting there, you're talking about a process that's, uh, like you said, not going to be, you know, you know, one year's time shovel in the ground, you know, six months later, you get a beautiful, you know, house, it, it takes a lot. Um, even from there, if you wanted to get, you know, even a little more granular, getting down to trying to acquire the financing and funding for a site acquisition, if you don't own the, the, the parcels or the land that you're trying to build on top of, that can be tricky. Um, you know, we have the challenge here in Pittsburgh of having a lot of property that is abandoned. And so if you're talking about title clearing, um, you know, that also adds another layer of complexity and time. Um, the financing, you know, what, what you were alluding to in the very beginning of this question is the hardest part um, because affordable housing isn't cheap. Um, good affordable housing isn't cheap, um, especially if you're doing new construction. Um, and so it's one of those things where it's, it's not like there's um, a treasure trove of, you know, liquid funds at the city that we can just kind of dip into whenever we need. Um, most affordable housing projects take a mix of, you know, sometimes state dollars, uh, leveraging debt, local dollars, uh, federal dollars, if we can scrape them together. Um, that uh, makes it, you know, extends a timeline and makes it difficult to deliver things in the kind of, um, you know, quick, quick, quick uh, timeline that people want. Obviously, you know, we're against a clock because it's a crisis. People need to house. Uh, people need to have roofs over their heads. And so we move with expediency, but there are um, a myriad of, uh, you know, either regulations or just time constraints that make it very difficult. And so, um you know, affordable housing is one of those things where uh, we all agree we need it. 
um, but we don't all know or agree how to get the money to do it. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it can be lengthy. Um, and again, folks on this call are probably can attest to their own projects that have taken years. Like you said, Laura Mer Choice has taken years and that was even with a guarantee of federal dollars, which again, are few and far between. So um, it's, it's a lengthy process. Um, and I think with uh, Diamante's leadership at the URA, we've gotten very nimble uh, but still, it takes a quite a bit of time uh, to make sure that you do it and do it right. So, so towards your point, towards both of your points, um, one of the ways I've begun sort of articulating and talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, affordable housing, is that my goal is to ensure, regardless of income, that you have a good, decent place to live, right? And it sort of makes me think of a story from when I was in Manchester. And there was a woman who stood up in the community meeting and said, we don't need any more affordable housing. Um, we have too much of that within our community. Um, we need more market rate housing. And the conversation went on and on. At some point I got irritated and I sort of stood up and said, man, with all due respect, you live in an affordable home. It was just made affordable for you at, at your income range that you could afford because the reality was we had spent millions of dollars cleaning up a, a bad lot that had environmental issues. We had spent millions more subsidizing the development so that she could now have a $300,000 home, right? Because that's what she could afford at her income level. But my point was, if I'm willing to spend millions and it was the right thing to do to build this sort of market rate development that this community needs, then I'm also willing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to ensure someone who could only afford a $100,000 home or a $50,000 home can afford. But what I also came to learn, and, I'm, and I'm, this is a long way of getting at a question, Director Walker, and, and Lindsay can respond as well, is that part of what I think we have to do, and I think part of what you're working to do at the URA is we can't build our way out of an affordable housing crisis. We can't do it. But we do have, to Chief Powell's um, point, we have a whole lot of vacant property that could be invested in, that could become that $50,000 home, that $80,000 home, that $130,000 home, that is a good home for someone who's probably right now spending more on rent than they could on a mortgage. So could you talk to us a little bit about what the URA is doing um, in order to address that market. And just, you may not be able to say it, but I can, to explicitly provide opportunities for Black, for black home ownership. Absolutely. So, I, you, you know, the other part of this, I think, about why is it so difficult to build affordable housing? I think you also have to have city policy that creates an environment where that type of build is possible. And so we have some very arcane rules around zoning and PLI and parking requirements that just do not lend themselves to the kind of development that we want to do. The tools are out there, the resources are out there. I think, you know, we're reaching a point where we can't look at you know, just creating a housing opportunity fund to, to build the financing to, to do some of this. We've also got to do some of the rulemaking that makes it easier for those types of, for those development typologies to happen. I'm here, I'm, you know, I'm hearing a lot of, you know, movement there and that, that encourages me, but the, fun, the financing is only one part because you may be paying more money to circumvent arcane rules change the rules and it makes the money a little bit more liquid. So that's one of the things that I think we have to do. And I hate to compare us to Atlanta, but other major metros where black people are doing well, part of it is because we figured out how to change the rules to create the environment to do that. So that, that's one piece of it. The other piece of it, some of what the URA is doing is we have uh, began to try to focus as much on creating affordable home ownership as we do providing rental gap assistance. Because what I've been saying is that I know a lot of families that are living in public housing and they are paying the ceiling rent. So they may be paying $900 for a three bedroom unit where that's an affordable unit, right? Now, where are you gonna get a three bedroom apartment for $900 in the city of Pittsburgh? You're not gonna find one. But when we do, uh, when we look at that same family and we look at how we might be able to leverage their Section 8 voucher for them to own a home, they may be paying closer to six or $700 for a three bedroom house. 
And so, and then if we were to open up that unit they're currently living in, we need more three bedroom apartments. You could open that unit up for a single mom who's only making 12 or $13 an hour and really can't afford to pay much more than three or $400 a month for rent. So we have to, um, so part of what we've tried to do is really focus and target that population and help people understand how to make the transition into home ownership. That is not just providing second deferred mortgages or primary mortgages or relaxing credit standards, but also providing the education and the support to make that jump, you know, um, to, to, to reduce some of that fear. And so we've had a tremendous amount of, of success pairing the work of the Pittsburgh Housing Development Corporation, which acquires and rehabs homes in dis distressed properties in some of these targeted neighborhoods, working with the Housing Opportunity Fund to provide um, second deferred mortgages, as well as um, down payment and closing cost assistance. And now you're talking about putting a family in position to buy a house, as you said, Councilman Lavelle, that may be worth $250,000. But for that, for that family, we've now stacked these tools and these resources, and it's, it becomes a $100,000 home. I, you know, I don't always think of it as affordable housing. I try to think of it in terms of what's economically feasible because I can afford one thing and everybody else on this call can afford something else. So people would argue Pittsburgh is affordable, but I think the question is who is it economically feasible for? And again, I think this is where we start having all the agencies that are working on affordable housing, developing tools and resources that can very easily be stacked together so that we can you know, multiply the impact that we're having. I was just going to add, you know, I think that staffing part is so critical and, and something that everyone on this call is a part of is, is the land bank. Um, the land bank, um, for those listening, uh, is the city's tool to turn return unproductive or vacant, blighted land back into reuse, put it back on the tax rolls so that house next to you that's been vacant forever, how do you make sure that it's able to go to an individual or a family who, who wants to you know, purchase their, their first home or purchase a home in Pittsburgh. Um, and because of state law, land banks are able to operate differently from the city or from the URA, which uh, you know, the city has to, by law, um, sell a house to a, the highest bidder. URA has some other kind of state redevelopment laws that make it a little more difficult for just, again, Miss May down the block who, who may want to actually, you know, purchase the home next to her that's been vacant forever. The land bank is a, is a really nimble tool that's, um, you know, we're, we're building it so that it's able to be stackable in the way that Director Walker talked about, where we can maybe layer on a second deferred mortgage, we can get assistance from the housing authority. Um, you know, we're exploring ways to uh, you know, have, provide more uh, dollars for rehab, which is, you know, desperately needed for a lot of our properties. And so that thinking of making sure that we're um, making things affordable for everyone to Director Walker's point again of, you know, what's affordable for one person isn't affordable to the other. But we also know that there is a, a disproportionately a certain, you know, AMI, a certain income level that needs a lot more assistance. And so how do we make sure that these like stackable tools are able to be adapted and used for, for those in, in the most need is also critically important as well. Speaking of the land bank, I think you and I exchanged about 30 emails today, <laughs> just trying to figure out. So it's a complicated thing, but it's a fantastic tool. If we can, you know, work um, to fix some of the legislative issues, as well as um, some of, some of, I think some of the resistance and the fear around what the power of what a land bank can do. It's a community investment tool. And that's the way that we intend to use it at the URA. And I think I failed to mention one other thing that we're doing, which is the notion of own PGH, which will essentially create a vehicle for that stacking to occur, for us to work with the housing authority, for us to work with the HOF, city council and the mayor's office um, to create a plug and play model for how we transition folks to home ownership. So COVID has um, exasperated many of the problems that we found in the black community. One of the things that it did um, was it actually suffocated black businesses. Many of them didn't have capital. And, um, and then even when the CARES money came down, unless you had a payroll system, you really couldn't apply for that money. If you were a mom and, let's say you were a mom and pop grocery store or mom and pop um, dry cleaner even, or um, um, a bar or a small church, you know, you pay by check or by cash 
you wouldn't you you couldn't get any of those dollars. And so, um, I one of the things that I, I saw, and I want you to kind of both talk about it, is um, the catapult program. Um, if if we realize that if 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 the black community is going to get wealth, it's going to be through black businesses, and you know we know that black females disproportionately um, recently are the are the architects of black businesses, and so. Um, I know both of you have worked in it, and it's an amazing program. Talk a little bit about um, um, the Catapult program and then programs in general that we do to help Black entrepreneurship. So if I may, I'd like to start with a couple of statistics. And these statistics, I think, are, <laughs> are um, sort of important for you, too, because I, you, you uh, made a very sizable investment by way of CARES Act dollars to the URA. Uh, about, I think, a little over three or four million dollars. And so we were able to deploy six point eight million dollars in low interest rate loans for emergency assistance directly after COVID. Uh, we received about two hundred and eighty four applications. Two hundred and eighty two of those applications came from uh, black businesses, two hundred and seventy of them black women owned businesses. So I think that was a remarkable deployment. The URA typically does about 50 loans in a year. <laughs> and so to, uh, you know, almost do six times that amount, I think was, you know, we could not have done that without the support of council and the mayor's office. So I want to take a moment to thank you uh, for that. And, um, and but I, I, but I say that also to say that when we think about catapult, um, you know, this was really born out of a really crazy, <laughs> crazy idea that I had, you know, previously working in community development and wanting to do something that really helped black businesses, black women owned businesses prepare for retail opportunities. There was really nothing in the ecosystem that would provide a demonstration of how to operate a storefront. And so um, at, the, at that same time, Tammy Thompson, uh, who, who's the, the, um, the executive director of what was Circles and is now the Catapult Pittsburgh um, North nonprofit, uh, said that she really, her heart, you know, really, she really wanted to cultivate and develop something. So I think I called you, Councilman Lavelle, and said, hey, I need $10,000 to seed into this crazy idea that I have. And he's like, do it. <laughs> he's like, and I was like, you know, I, I just need, I need board support. I need, I need mayor's office support to do this. Majestic and I had a conversation about this. And what we did is we said, all right, we want to prepare these businesses to, to have storefronts in Larmer once Larmer Avenue is uh, redeveloped. And so how are we gonna do that? We needed to leverage a strong edge, which was <laughs> Penn Avenue in order to help these businesses start to grow and start to develop. And so in partnership with uh, Catapult, with um, Circles Greater Pittsburgh, ELDI and pa the Paramount Co-op, we created a 12 month business incubation program that would work with this cohort of businesses uh, to help them upskill and understand how to manage a business on the back end. But the second part of that, and this is really to Tammy Thompson's credit, she was able to work with ELDI to leverage the old rainbow storefront and to an ELDI because they owned and controlled the real estate was able to reduce the rent and work with that $10,000 grant from the URA to help activate that site. And so there's a picture that circulates where you see these 12 black women that are occupying this space at their ribbon cutting. And, you know, and I think it's so powerful and so impactful because I hear a lot of, um, you know, people feel like pop-ups aren't really the answer and that these intermediary remedial um, interventions don't really work. But I'll tell you, a lot of those women were on the poverty cliff and now they've been able to reduce their reliance upon subsidy because they are wealthy in their businesses. They have their babies with them developing and designing and growing in this business. And then, so when we talk about generational wealth, that's really what Catapult has been able to do. It's a two generation strategy. Um, so I, I think it's a powerful, powerful tool. And I will tell you that $10,000 investment by way of the city and the URA has now transformed into a million dollar investment from the PNC Foundation that saw the promise and the, and the, and the impact of that work. And so that $10,000, that's why I said it's not always about money. That $10,000 seed you know, showed and demonstrated to the private sector that they also benefit from investing in these businesses. So very proud of the work that Tammy Thompson has done. I know she wasn't able to be here this evening, but um, she's taken that, that, you know, that, you know, nominal concept that I had, you know, ruminated over 
um, for a couple of months. And she's grown that into multiple spinoffs of creating entrepreneurship opportunities for kids, culinary. I mean, you name it, she's really taken that and, and really developed something formidable. And so can you tell us, just talk, tell us real briefly, um, if someone wants to get involved with Catapult, I know we're currently accepting applications for the location in the Hill District. Mm -hmm. You could just share some information on how someone can get involved. Sure. So we do rounds of um, open application. Uh, it's com very competitive <laughs> because it's a cohort model. And so the Hill District cohort is actually closed and those businesses are scheduled to open. We are anticipating a ribbon cutting maybe late May, early June is what, what I'm anticipating, but we will do it in waves. And so applications typically open up in April and November, I believe. But if they send an email to me at dwalker at ura.org, I will connect them with uh, Tammy and Catapult and make sure that they receive notification of the application when it opens up. I just wanted to explicitly, you know, um, you know, shout out Director Walker again, because it started off on Penn Avenue, it's down on Center Avenue. Um, you know, you created a model that's uh, easily replicatable and we're hoping to get a catapult um, on all of the major business corridors across the city. And so, um, you know, definitely, definitely, definitely there are more to come. So one of the things I think is that, you know, as a city, we've done a lot of cutting edge stuff, but we don't always, because we're really more concerned with uplifting people and providing needs versus, you know, publicizing it. we we'll talk about, um, one of the things I am actually excited about is Invest PGH. Can you talk, Lindsay, a little bit about Invest PGH, what it does, how it connects for connects to black businesses specifically and how how it's how it's going about seeking funding absolutely and, and um uh demonte director walker please jump in as you see fit but invest pgh i think is incredibly exciting it's the city's first cfi um, a cfi is a community development uh financial institution and for context there are less than a thousand i believe nationwide uh and uh Philadelphia, for context, again, has probably 17 CDFIs that work within their city, while as Pittsburgh um, doesn't have one explicitly that's for the whole city. There are, I think, maybe two or three, four that work on a specific neighborhood or, um, you know, initiative, but nothing as big as what we have. Um, so what a CDFI does, basically, um, is it's uh, an organization that's able to provide um, capital and, and technical assistance. Um, you know, for us, it's, it's for small businesses as well as affordable housing. Um, our micro loan, our micro in enterprise loan program is housed there. Um, and we've done, you know, through the URA, a tremendous job of explicitly trying to target and, and um, you know, partner with black businesses. The micro loan program, and, and Diamante, you know these numbers probably off the top of your head, but Every board meeting, we, we um, you know, talk about those stats. They are probably over 60%, uh, maybe 70% Black. 78. <laughs> there you go, 78% Black-owned businesses, also over 60% women-owned businesses. Um, and so when we're talking about our commitment to Black residents and particularly Black women, you know, it's, it's right there. It's evident. Um, Invest PGH uh, will really be kind of like a clearinghouse for resources and tools um, that'll support small businesses. Um, you know, we're really excited to see it expand as well as, you know, we've been getting a lot of investments from some of the cor corporations in the, in the region that see, you know, the need for this CDFI, but also, um, you know, feel moved to donate and make sure that, you know, the dollars that we have are able to um, you know, really penetrate neighborhoods and communities. Um, Invest PGH, I think what also is, is really special about it is that, um, like I said, uh, we've missed out on so many opportunities for federal funding because we didn't have a CDFI here in That's Pittsburgh. Right. And so it's frustrating, you know, when you see on the other side of the state, that they've got, you know, 17 different organizations scraping for money, um, you know, fighting over it. And we don't have a single place or a single organization um, to receive that money. And so it's really exciting, again, that it's on this side of the state uh, so that we're able to, um, able to, uh, you know, ensure that we're getting that funding as well. 
Um, overall, we want to make sure that we're maximizing impact, um, that we're really focusing on local businesses and small businesses. Um, and making sure that we have, uh, again, sustainable solutions to ensure that we're not just, you know, giving a business a little bit of money to keep them afloat, but also the, the tools, the support and resources to make sure that it's a, a, a business that'll be there for generations to come. Yes. So we have about a $15 million of fundraising goal um, for Invest PGH. We've raised about 20% of that to date. Um, I think that Invest PGH has become a vehicle to call on corporate social responsibility, which is something that I don't think we've done a very good job of here in Pittsburgh. And, and I think part of it is because how do you capture it? I know that there's a hesitation to kind of put it at the URA because there's perception of it being a really big bureaucracy and the money comes in and does it ever come out? And I think what people don't understand is that the URA is driven by the funding that it's able to draw down. So if we're living off of CDBG. It's very hard to move CDBG. So the investment from the PNC Foundation, uh, Citizens Bank by way of an EQ2 investment into Invest PGH, and just yesterday, F&B infusing uh, $2 million into the URA and Invest PGH, it allows us to be nimble and to really address those need, those creative needs of Black entrepreneurs in a way that we were not able to do even 14 months ago. And so I want to thank the work, you know, thank you, Councilman Lavelle and Chief Powell for the work that you've done to advocate for the URA, um, to be seen as the responsible steward to take on these dollars. Um, and so we, you know, we are actively fundraising and, you know, very grateful for the leadership that you've shown to make this a possibility. So towards that end, because I was really, really excited um, yesterday when f &B announced their it was really about a $7 million commitment because they also yes. committed $5 million yes. to help bridge gaps on minority mm -hmm. developments. Um, yes. but $2 million are going to the URA, mm -hmm. one for Invest PGH, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and then another million to create a, a line of credit program mm -hmm. to support Black businesses, Black entrepreneurs who may not have sort of the, over, the carrying capital that they need to participate right. in development. That's right. But towards that point, what I, what I would like you to do Often, the Urban Redevelopment Authority, specifically, because of our historical nature, right? Because we were the entity that helped destroy the Lower Hill, because the city played a role in that, because the city and the URA played a role in the destruction of East Liberty, be quite frank, yes. or, the, or the North Side when they built the highway and did all these other sort of things. Historically, within our community, there's this tension that exists with the URA. But at the same time, I don't know of another entity in the city that's giving more loans at lower rates to black businesses than the URA. I don't know of a bank that's no. doing more than what the URA is doing. No. I don't know of another organization that says, okay, we're trying to help minority businesses. They don't have enough capital to front for three to four months. Therefore, we're gonna raise money to assist them. That's, so one, I, I wanna give credit where credit is due because so often we look at historical organizations and don't realize when they're actually working to our, towards our benefit because we simply don't trust them. Yeah. But two, that's a long way of saying, can you talk a little bit more about the investment um, F&B made and what it's actually gonna to look to accomplish both within Invest PGH as well as the Lower Hill site and how we are at every turn actually trying to figure out and probably doing more than anyone else in this city to support black businesses and black entrepreneurs? I think it's a great question and it's a great note. And I, and I, this is the second time I've been asked that question in two days. And what I've been saying is that, listen, the URA earned its reputation, right? It earned its reputation of not being trusted in communities. And I don't want to gloss over that. And I don't want to pretend that three or four years of work, uh, you know, as a panacea, for all the things that happened wrong before. I think that those of us that sit around that table now have a responsibility to try to rebuild those bonds of trust. I take that very seriously. I am going gray, <laughs> you know, trying to come up with strategies and work in partnership with all of you about how to do that. And so, and I, and I think, you know, one of the things I'll say very quickly is that you know, we are offering debt to businesses. And I think that's remarkable because you can't go anywhere and get a 2% or 3% interest rate with a credit score below 600. You can come to the URA and you can get that because we're doing character and community-based lending. 
What I want to be in a position to do over the next couple of months is to also be able to provide grants. I think that's going to be very, very important to level the playing field. And that's where I think that these ARP dollars can come into place. I want to be, I don't want to sit up here and praise us because we are offering debt. We are offering the very best kind of debt, the most ethical debt I think you're going to find in the market. And I stand on that. I think with the FMB investment yesterday announcing $7 million, what that means is that we are finding a way to combat gentrification. We are allowing, you know, market forces to come into play to do at the heavy lift of economic development while simultaneously positioning residents and stakeholders and, and businesses in the Hill District to participate in that. And that is very, very important because that didn't happen in the last iteration or the last wave of economic development. So what that means, it means that Tom's Barbershop, Ham's Barbershop happens because now there's a primary lender who's willing to go all in. It means that Studio Volsi happens because there's a primary lender willing to go all in. And then they've taken it a step further and they've allowed, they've given the URA the ability to do lines of credit. You can't mobilize on the lower hill for a half a million dollar project without a line of credit. And so it was very important to me that we figure out how to be the solution for that. And, you know, in the URA invested a significant amount of money in building the software to offer a line of credit. That would not have happened uh, 14 months ago. So I think that, I, you know, I want people to understand that we are systematically trying to rebuild the bonds of trust. That is why we have the board that we have. That is why we have the staff that we have. And I think that, you know, one of the things I think could, could and should be helpful is that, yes, the URA made historical mistakes. I don't own those mistakes. I didn't make those mistakes. I was harmed as a, re as a resident in the Hill District by those mistakes. The tool is only as ethical as the people who wield it. And I know my ethics, I know my values, I know your values as board members. And I think that people have got to give that a shot because what happens is how do you get F&B to invest? Because they start to see the benefit and the impact. If there's too much deriding and too much fear and too much negativity and animosity, we can't bring more players to the table to help build and cultivate that trust. So I think it's very important uh, what they did yesterday. And I am looking to the public sector to equip us to do some match to those dollars and also offer some grant level reprieve. So Lindsay and Yamati, um before we go get too, too late in the show, I, I would like for both of you to talk a little bit about something that all of us on this call um, have helped birth, um, a partnership with the mayor's office, the URA, and council create this vision called Avenues of Hope. One of the things I, am strong, I feel very strongly about is we, we, when we come out of COVID, we have to come out of COVID with splash projects, with tangible, transformational projects that people can see, feel, and touch, right? And, 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 and in a very concentrated way. And I think the Avenues of Hope gives an opportunity to, across the city, in Black people's communities across this city, create a project that provides housing, businesses, employment, all the things that they need in one place and, and, and gives them a tangible manifestation of the city's investment. And so the two of you talk a little bit about Avenues of Hope and and um, I, I'm, of course, I'm excited about it and see, kind of give me, give me a sense of if my, my enthusiasm is warranted. I want to hear from Lindsay on this one. I've talked enough, so please. No, <laughs> you're just so uh, entrancing that I just always want to listen to you. But um, Avenues of Hope, I think, is, is to your, what you said, Rev. Avenues of Hope, I think, is really exciting because it's that opportunity neighborhood rich approach. It's not just thinking about housing. It's not just thinking about um, uh, employment. It's not just thinking about place. It's people and place. Um, the focus of Avenues of Hope are our black and divested main streets. It's thinking specifically, how do we create opportunities for black ownership in these spaces that have been um, you know, previously hubs of arts and culture um, and, and just storied avenues that have been, you know, that historically divested from um, and have fallen off. How do we make sure that we are centering this explicitly around Black people, uh, which I think makes it so radically different from the rest of the projects that we do? I think also, again, going back to the idea of creating um, opportunity rich neighborhoods, you know, if you build housing, market or affordable, 
um, in a space that has uh, no grocery store, you know, no good transportation, you know, options outside of owning a car, um, you know, no place to go, you know, have a, a beer you know, on a nice, you know, warm summer night. You're, you're creating these spaces in isolation. Um, and I think the city has learned uh, from previous efforts that, you know, as much as you build up one piece of the puzzle, if it's still lacking that ability to be walkable or that ability to be, um, you know, integrated into all the other things that a resident may need, it's for not. And so how, so Avenues of Hope, again, focuses on that robust connectivity of these, um, you know, resources rather than just like focusing on one and the kind of idea of, you know, if you build it, they'll come. It's let's just build all the things. <laughs> let's get them all together to make sure that we're conscientiously, um, you know, investing in these neighborhoods and not investing for investing sake, but investing with community, um, you know, taking them along for the ride. Um, avenues of hope, and I neglected to say this at the beginning, you know, explicitly we're focusing on Perrysville, the north side, uh, Warrington Ave um, in the south side, Homewood Ave, Larmer, um, Chartiers, and, and Center Avenue, as well as uh, Second Avenue in, in Hazelwood. So there's seven. Um, so it's, it's, you know, ambitious, um, but I think that that's the way to go. I think you need to explicitly call out, you know, what we're looking for um, and, and make sure that, uh, you know, uh, philanthropy and corporations come along for the ride. As we've seen, it's, you know, while obviously we're grateful for partnership, it's unfortunate that people feel called to action because of, you know, our, our kind of like, you know, racial reckoning that's happening as well as COVID, but, you know, people are here at the table now and people want to invest and they're investing in Invest PGH, they're investing in URA opportunities, they want to match the dollars that we can put up. And so as a city, uh, you know, there's only so much, you know, kind of flexible dollars that we have for these innovative, exciting ideas, right? Because roads still need paved, um, you know, people still need their garbage picked up, like that stuff needs to happen. And so some of this stuff where, you know, it's, it's more, um, you know, you need those like flexible dollars. It's so critical that there are our partnerships and we're seeing consistently that um, corporations locally and nationally want in, they want to be at the forefront of this, um, you know, uh, exciting endeavor. And so uh, Avenues of Hope is one of the projects that I get really, really geeked about just because there's so much, um, even if you're not a housing person, even if you're not an employment person, if you're interested in arts and green spaces, like that's all a part of this initiative. Um, and to, again, explicitly say we are doing this for Black residents, um, you know, it makes it even, even better, even sweeter. Hey, Marty, what I think about is imagine if Butler Street was home with Avenue, right? If, mm -hmm. if the same thing you saw on Butler Street in Lawrenceville became home with Avenue, where you could live there, shop there, go to school there. We already have the University of Pittsburgh is there offering classes, CCAC is there. If there's drugstores and restaurants, you live upstairs and there's after school programming and counseling programming and, and you could walk to it. It's all right there in your own neighborhood. And it's mostly, you know, anyone can live there, but it also has a place where African Americans can can do their their, their um, the cultural and dance and drama and painting on one place. Yeah, I mean, so I you know, avenues of hope for me is just that is just what it says. I think it's a hopeful opportunity uh, for how we manage and how we steward Black life in Pittsburgh. When we say that Black life matters, we have to look at Black neighborhoods matter and what's already there matters. And I think most importantly for, you know, for Black people, um, I think that they people want to feel like they're like they are part of something that's around placekeeping and you want to keep black neighborhoods feeling black that doesn't have to have to be synonymous with blight. And I think one of our traumas here in Pittsburgh is that people feel like the betterment of a neighborhood automatically means that it's for somebody else. Avenues of Hope for me is about investing in Black neighborhoods and saying, this is for you. This is so that you can stay here, live here, and thrive here. We're not investing in places in hopes of some better resident to, that comes to the neighborhood and makes the neighborhood this avant-garde thing. It means that 
North Homewood Avenue is already special and unique, one, because of its history, but also because of what could happen there now and how the residents there can plug into it now. And so I think, you know, Lindsay summed it up. It's a place-based strategy, and we've done a great job of doing place-based strategies in Pittsburgh. It also has to be people-based. The point is the people. And so as the URA, you know, tries to right its ship and, you know, like I said, do some of this soul searching, you know, we need to figure out what those people-based investments look like. And it can't all be investment from the public sector or from the private sector. It also has to be resident and neighborhood investment. And how do they have more autonomy over their lives or they're not at the whim of all the decisions that we make around board tables? How do we get to a point where communities can make decisions that are in their best interest as well? It's close to an hour. I mean, has, is it? Oh my goodness. Yeah, it is. Oh. Uh, we promise to both keep you for an hour because you're both busy people. But I do have sort of at least one last question that I would like to put on the table. Um, we started off this conversation talking about the sort of once in a lifetime opportunity we have because of the infusion of resources that are getting ready to come into our city. Thankful for our, thankfully to our new president, Ch President Joe Biden. Um, with that in mind, as, I, as you're both aware, myself and Reverend Burgess have begun thinking about how to utilize those dollars. And we've even put together in conjunction and with the support of the mayor, a uh, sort of a task force to look at how to best equitably spend those dollars and specifically from the framework of how to invest in the black community. So what we've also come to learn is it's probably not a good idea to try to accomplish 10 things with those dollars, but rather focus on one or two things that will really have a long lasting impact. If you had your wish, or, your, or if you had the opportunity, what would you sell, tell us to do with those dollars? That's tough. <laughs> um, you said only two? Two or three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> huh. Um, so I think that personally for me, you know, there's so much creativity uh, that we were seeing with housing, right? I think that in the, at least from my vantage point at the city and, and, and you know, as a URA board member, we're seeing a lot more ways to be creative around the, the um, housing space where we're getting to creating more housing that it's appropriate um, for all types of folks. Um, and so that, again, that kind of more flexible understanding of what affordable housing means. Um, there are, you know, some geniuses at the URA, the housing authority in the city, um, that will come up with some way to better articulate this, you know, than I, but, um, I think that if there's, um, a set aside, uh, for ways that we could expand some of the work that we do around, uh, vacant and blighted, you know, housing turn, you know, getting uh, dollars for rehab, turning it over, turning, the, you know, a brand new beautiful house over to, uh, you know, Miss May down the street. Like that's the kind of strategies that we need to expand and invest in. You know, Pittsburgh has over, um, the city of Pittsburgh has over uh, 15,000 parcels that we own, um, whether they're structured, whether they're vacant, we own so much land and, and unlike some of our cities that we look to for policy recommendations like in New York, like Boston, like San Francisco, you know, they're building on top of buildings. We have land. Um, any way to accelerate um, and invest in efforts to ensure that we're taking um, advantage of this like sometimes challenging, um, you know, opportunity, you know, is, is I think could be transformative. Um, I, if I had to pick a sec, I mean, I have several things, but a second thing, you know, I, I think of is health. Um, obviously, as a city, the city of Pittsburgh entity, um, you know, we're responsible for health outcomes, but not responsible for outcomes, right? You know, when you're thinking about, um, you know, green spaces and ability to like, you know, exercise outside and stuff like that. Yes, we have a role in it, but, you know, we know we have a city that has, massive disparities in health outcomes for white residents and black residents. Um, investing in how we can create a healthier city. And I, I use healthy probably in a very flexible way, whether that's, you know, kind of mind and body, 
um, you know, makes, uh, makes a lot of sense to me. And then lastly, I would say, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to cap it there because I'm sure Diamante's wheels are spinning. <laughs> it, is, it is such a hard question. And it's the, it's the best question because you never think that you're going to see, you know, almost a half a billion dollars for your city that you've got to hurry up and spend. So, you know, as much dreaming as we do, I don't know that we were already, like we were really spending a lot of time thinking about this, but I would say, you know, it, I, I've been saying, I think we need to approach this like as though it were a choice neighborhood grant, but for the entire city. And that we really need to be focusing not on how much we get from the federal government, but how can we mobilize it and leverage it to start to attack things that, but because we still got to help with garbage and recycling, the things that we are not able to do, but we dream about because we have to prioritize. I think this is our opportunity to do it. So my top three things would be um, land recovery and stewardship for the purpose of, a, of increasing developable land for affordable housing. And that's really the work of the land bank. Uh, the second thing that I would focus on is uh, rethinking how we create affordable housing. Is there a way to ensure that every development that's happening across the city has some level of affordable housing consideration by way of accessing public resources. The third thing that I would focus on, and these are probably interconnected, is jobs and infrastructure. You know, our city is aging. Uh, you know, we there are going to be some infrastructure dollars, but I think that we re we are obsessed with construction jobs when we talk about Black people. I want us to become obsessed with knowledge work. That is where the money is. I don't, and we talk about tech, but Underneath tech, you will find knowledge work. That's how people get good paying jobs. So it would be a lot around using those dollars to upskill and to skill our workforce. Thank you. That, that is perfect. We will absolutely take that into consideration. Um, so with that being said, that is all the time we have for today's show. Um, I want to thank our guest, um, Ms. Diamante Walker, the Deputy Executive Director of the Urban Redevelopment Authority, and Ms. Lindsay Powell, Assistant Chief of Staff to Mayor Peduto. In order to have and reinvest in our communities, it's imperative that we absolutely intentionally divert resources into them um, in order for them to become safe and prosperous and peaceful. And I hope that this evening um, with our partners and allies that we've demonstrated that we are committed to rebuilding black communities for in Pittsburgh for black people, black, black people. And I thank you all for your time. Thank you for the I want to thank all of you for watching and participating in this town hall meeting. Remember, you can watch this show on Facebook, the city's YouTube channel, or the city's cable channel. A new meeting will occur every Wednesday in August, or every Wednesday going forward, sorry. Um, by working together, uniting the purpose, we can transform our city, strengthen it for all of its residents. Pittsburgh can only be, and will only be a city for all, and we're strong, we are, we are working to make it a city for all, and it will be a city for all as it becomes a city where Black Pittsburgh matters. Thank you very much. Good evening, stay safe, and be blessed.